Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation for the Young Scientist webinar series. We'll be hearing from Clara Bird on individual behavioral specializations in gray whales documented through drone-based observation. And next month, um, it says March 8th, but it's actually the second Tuesday of April, my bad. Uh, we'll be hearing from Noah Dolnachek on employing photography and community science to explore the diets of tufted puffins at Haystack Rock. I'd like to acknowledge that uh, the Cape Perpetua area landscape that stretches from Yachats to Florence is the traditional territory of the Select tribe and the Coos Lower Umpqua and Sayuslaw tribe and acknowledge the tribal governments and their roles historically and today in taking care of these lands. And you can learn more about each of these respective tribes on their websites. A little bit about the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. My name is Tara Dubois. I'm the communications coordinator for the collaborative. And the vision is to foster conservation and collaboration within local communities for scientific exchange, management, awareness, and stewardship from the land to the sea in and around the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. And our three guiding principles are community engagement, leveraging resources, and engaging in partnerships. And you can see the logos here at the bottom. There are a variety of um, partners that came together and created and formed the collaborative in 2017. And in addition to these folks, I'd like to acknowledge um, the many Biz, local businesses, local governments, um, nonprofits, and volunteers um, that also uh, support the collaborative. And really, we couldn't do this work without any of our partners and volunteers. A little bit about the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. That's the collaborative's focus. Uh, Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve is the largest of five in Oregon. And in addition to marine protected areas to the north and south, there is some form of water uh, protected waters that stretch between Yahats and Florence. And you can see here's just some nice gorgeous views of this wild, uh, beautiful area um, between Yahats and Florence. You can learn more about that on our website, in addition to uh, the community science uh, that we host at Cape Perpetua. Uh, we have a variety of projects, as you can see here, um, that the community can get involved in. Some of them are seasonal, but we do year round beach cleanups, as well as our Cape Perpetua Bio Blitz series um, through the iNaturalist.org app. You can download and help us document biodiversity any time of the year. Um, and in addition to this webinar series, we also host a speaker series on Saturdays through March. Our last uh, installment of that will be this coming Saturday, uh, the 12th, and we'll be learning more about Oregon's Marine Reserves from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And like I said, visit our website, kperpetualcollaborative.org, um, to learn more information about any of these events or learn more about the Marine Reserve or the Collaborative. And I also like to encourage folks to connect with us on our Facebook and our YouTube. And if you like the work we're doing, we do have a donate button at the top of our website. You can just click on that and it will take you through the steps. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Clara Bird is a third year wildlife science PhD student in the geospatial ecology of marine megafauna gem lab at Oregon State University under the supervision of Dr. Lee Torres. Originally from Michigan, she earned her undergraduate degree from Duke University where she conducted research using drones to conduct Adelaide penguin population surveys and to study the body condition of humpback and minke whales in Antarctic using photo, photogrammetry. Very cool. And with that, Clara, I'm gonna stop share. So you can bring yours up now. Um, and just wanna let the audience know that at the end of the presentation, we will do a Q&A session. So as questions come up throughout uh, the presentation, please feel free to plug them into the chat or the Q&A box and we will um, get to those at the end. And with that, Clara, Clara, <laughs> Clara, Clara um, you are, you can take it over. Okay, let me... Nope, that's not working. One second. You would think that after <laughs> all this two years, we would be better. <laughs> yeah. 
Here we are. Okay. It just knows. Perfect. That's great. How's that? Fantastic. That's good. Okay. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me on this Tuesday evening. I'm very excited to be here talking to all of you about my work using drones to study gray whale behavior and body condition. And today we'll have a little extra focus on individual specialization. So the whales that I study are a part of the Pacific Coast feeding group of gray whales. This is a group of about 250 Eastern North Pacific population gray whales. And this is a population that spends their winter at the breeding grounds in Baja, Mexico, down here. And then they migrate north for the summer to feed in the Arctic. However, the PCFG doesn't go all the way to the Arctic. They actually stop off the coast of the Pacific Northwest to feed. Um, which is very convenient convenient for us here at the Hatfield um, Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon. And so all of our field work is on these PCFG, PCFG gray whales that are easily accessible for us to hop into a small boat and collect data. And um, just an interesting note, we don't know exactly why the PCFG are the PCFG. We don't know why they don't go all the way north. And they aren't necessarily always the exact same group. Some of the whales might go to the Arctic and spend another year in the PCFG range. That's not um, necessarily a permanent thing. And the current project that we're a part of for the PCFG is the Granite Project. This is my little PhD fits in here. And the Granite Project is the gray whale response to ambient noise informed by technology and ecology project led by uh, Lee Torres, who leads the GEM lab. But we have an awesome team of um, co-project leaders working with us. Um, and I just want to highlight uh, what a collaborative effort that this project is. And this project is aimed at understanding how the local gray whale group that we study are affected by uh, the disturbance of ambient noise, primarily from vessel traffic. And we're using a lot of different cool tools and techniques to answer this question. The framework of this project is the PCOMS framework or population consequences of multiple stressors. I know that this diagram is <laughs> a lot to take in, so let's walk through it a little bit. Essentially, the idea is we want to understand the effect of a stressor, in this case noise, on a population. And so kind of the response variable is population dynamics. Is the population growing? Is the population growth slowing down? Is it decreasing? How is, that, how is a population affected by disturbance? But to answer that, we actually have to figure out all of these connecting relationships in between, which you see here in these colorful squares. And so these components include physiology, behavior, health, and vital rates. And we need to look at these relationships on an individual level. So look at individual animals. What did the relationship look like for an individual? And what is that relationship constant across all individuals? Or is it different? And do we need to take that into account when we're looking at this question? And so an example, Behavior in our case is going to be primarily foraging behavior. Does disturbance lead to a decrease in foraging or an increase? How does that interact with physiology, primarily stress hormones? Does that affect behavior? And then connecting that to health, which in this project is mostly body condition, looking at the fat stores, right? Whales, we need, we want our whales to be fat and happy and have a good thick blubber layer of uh, energy reserves. And these three factors all interact and then are related to the vital rate of an individual, which is, can be broken down into its survival. So if a whale is really impacted, maybe it's so emaciated that it ends up dying, or it's fecundity, essentially it's reproductive rate. So the animal might not die, but the animal might be so impacted that it's not in high enough body condition to reproduce. And if enough individuals are impacted in this way, we might see the population birth rate uh, drastically decrease, especially if this disturbance occurs over many years. And so this is the big framework that we're working within and trying to answer. And so this, as you can see, all these different boxes are massive projects, massive undertakings on their own. And so we have um, a big team, a lot of different methods to try and fill in all of these puzzle pieces. And so I'll walk you through kind of a little preview of our approach to each of these. And then you'll see a little picture up here kind of highlighting um, the different team members taking on these components to highlight that this is absolutely not just me. I have an incredible, we, I am a part of an incredible uh, team. 
So for behavior, as I mentioned, we're primarily using drones to look at their feeding rate to then relate behavior to habitat. Um, and you'll hear a lot more about this component today. Health is again from drone data measuring how fat the whales are and looking at how that trend is changing across the season and linking that to physiology, which for us is uh, stress hormones from their poop that we collect with nets. You can see here in this picture, it's that pink cloud in the water and we are frantically trying to collect the sample so that we can then look at the hormones. We then link all of this to vital rates and population dynamics. So using photo ID, we can track how long the individual is in our area, uh, if the individual, when the individual arrived, or maybe if the individual left and went somewhere else. We can also look at calving rates and all these factors that can tell us more about the dynamics of who is in our group, leaving the group, uh, so on and so forth. And finally, our uh, stressor for the project is noise. So we have two hydrophones in our study area um, that we're using uh, for the project to quantify noise. So briefly, let's talk about some methods. That photo ID that I mentioned is one of the most crucial uh, components of our data set. And this includes both traditional photo ID, so taking pictures of the whales from a boat, getting a picture of the side, and then photo ID from the drone. And so with the photo ID from the side, we have built an incredible catalog that we've linked to catalogs from collaborators who've been doing this work on these whales for longer than we have and actually can link these to when the whale was first seen by someone else to estimate age. Um, if they know the sex of the whale, we can then link that through photo ID. And we can link these traditional photo ID images to our drone images to then tie all of that data with our behavior and health data, which we get from drones. Um, so drones are the focus of the talk today. We can launch them from our boat and retrieve them from the boat, as you can see in this video. And they have revolutionized the field of marine mammal science in a lot of different fields because they are safer, more affordable, more efficient, and produce higher quality imagery than their counterparts of collecting data from a plane or a helicopter. We can also use them more easily than other methods. So we can, when we're on the boat, we have our drone just with us. We see a whale, we decide it's good to fly. We can get the drone up and over the whale within about five minutes. And Lee actually published a paper in 2018 that showed that drones have increased our observational capacity by threefold. So as you can see in this diagram, the whale is visible to the drone and therefore us later on when we're watching the footage for three times as long as it's visible to someone just on a boat looking at what the whale is doing at the surface. And in addition to just observation time, it also gives us better observation detail. So when you're looking at a whale from the side, you don't see much of the body. It's pretty hard to tell what it's doing unless it's a big kind of dramatic behavior. Whereas from the drone, we can see what it's doing subsurface in pretty um, wonder, amazing detail which helps us identify very specific behaviors that are important um, throughout my research. And so using drones, we've amassed quite the collection of data. And this plot is just to give you um, a little insight into just how much data we have. Here on the x-axis, we have individual whale names. On the y-axis, we have the month of the year 2018 going from June 2018 at the bottom to October 2018 at the top. And then the color in the rectangle just tells you how many flights were conducted over that individual in that month. And so really, all this means is that we've flown over a lot of different individuals and we fly over each individual a fair few number of times. And a highlight of 2018 being Orange Knuckles, who we flew over at least once a month every month of 2018. And so this data set, which started in 2016, has provided an incredible opportunity for us to look into behavior, which is the focus of my PhD. And so here you can see two whales here and here, and their head standing, which is um, a feeding tactic that I'll talk more about later. And so from this footage, I have four questions. And I'll talk about the first three today. Um, the first question is, do individuals show distinct behavior patterns? So as I mentioned from photo ID, 
we know exactly which whale is doing what behavior when. And the question is, if they're using different feeding tactics, does one individual always use the same tactic? Does it switch? Are they all just using all the tactics? We don't know. We want to see if there's a pattern. Then we want to see if behaviors are linked to habitat types. So the habitat of our study area is very variable and extremely patchy. So we have patches of sandy bottom, rocky, boulders, reef, kelp. It's very complex. And we see whales distributed throughout it, but without linking the behavior to the habitat, we're not, we can't be sure why the whale is where we're seeing it. But by using behavior, we can reveal the functional use of the habitat, which helps better inform distribution. Then I want to look at the relationship between behavior and body condition to see if certain behaviors, if a whale is specialized, does that behavior lead to better body condition? Is it a more advantageous foraging tactic than another using kind of body condition as that sign of success? And then finally, I want to look at how social behavior varies interseasonally and intraannually. So within a season from early to late, and then between seasons across all the years of our um, field data. And so this question is trying to connect to vital rates almost, but not quite, because it's not a breeding ground. We can't see them actually breeding. However, we've noticed, and other people have too, that as the foraging season progresses, we see more social behavior at the end. There's some whales that appear to stop feeding as much and are actually just starting to engage in frisky behavior as we call it with each other. And so we want to see if maybe there's some sort of body condition threshold that's separating the whales that have stopped feeding and started engaging in social behavior versus the whales that are still trying to gain body mass later in the season, which could maybe indicate some sort of body condition threshold for reproductive behavior. But before I can answer any of those questions, I want to walk you through a little bit of my methods to study behavior. So to start, I have to have an ethogram, which is my defined list of behaviors that I'm using, which allows me to have standardized kind of data effort across all the years of footage that I have to review. And to start building an ethogram, you have to split your state and point events. So a state event is associated with a duration. So you mark the stop and the stop the start and the stop, and then you have a length of time. And so you can use that to answer questions about percent time spent in a behavior, how long was that whale feeding, so on and so forth. Whereas a point event is not associated with a duration, it's just an instant point in time. And so you can't ask about duration or any kind of time budgeting, but you can ask about frequency, how often, how many times in a day did that whale exhibit that behavior. And so usually we'll split that by behaviors that clearly should be states or points. If a behavior just happens instantaneously, it's easier, it's better to just call it a point versus a behavior that's happening for an extended period of time where you do want to know the duration. So we have four primary states, travel, forage, social, and rest. And within each state, we have a series of tactics. And so you'll hear me say tactic uh, quite a few times throughout this presentation. And as you can see, we have some example tactics here and then the total number of tactics in my big final ethogram is under the arrow. And so for example, within foraging, we have headstanding, bubble blasting, side swimming and jaw flexing, which are a combination of state and point events. And this is just kind of an example of the final ethogram. So you can see there's a lot of behaviors, especially because we can identify so many from the drone. And then I use that ethogram to code my behaviors in Boris. And so Boris is an open source software that allows me to watch the video and code mark what behaviors are happening throughout. So I have my ethogram here in this box on the left, the list of subjects. So those are the names of the whales and then the events from this clip. And so this was a clip of um, Angie and exclamation. And you can see that using the software, I can code what each individual is doing separately, but in the, from the same video. And so just a raw output from Boris is this cool little plot. So this is Clouds and her calf Cheetah. And you can see we have time throughout the behavior observation on the x-axis, behaviors on the y. The colorful rectangles represent state behaviors, and every color represents a different behavior. 
And then the vertical little black bars are point behaviors. You can see that I record every breath, every blow, and that's a point event versus the entire foraging event, which is a state. And this is a lot of colorful rectangles to take in, but a cool kind of initial takeaway is this head standing behavior, which is a feeding tactic. And you can see clouds, the mom was head standing, and then cheetah actually started head standing next to its mom. Um, almost maybe trying to learn the feeding behavior, which is just interesting to look at that overlap in time, um, maybe some evidence of calves learning from their mothers. So once I code all of this data in Boris, I can move on to my research questions. So to start, we'll talk about individual behavioral specializations in gray whales. And so first I wanted to introduce some tactics um, that I'll be mentioning. These aren't all of them, but a good kind of uh, overview. So we have upside down swimming here in the top left. So the whale is swimming upside down and then it's doing jaw snapping, which is opening and closing its mouth underwater, presumably taking bites or gulps of prey. Side swimming and sculling is what's happening here in this kelp bed. So the whale is actually on its side pretty stationary, so it's not necessarily moving forward or back. It's just in the same spot on its side, and it's using its pectoral fins to skull, almost like treading water to stay in place, which is a pretty impressive behavior. And then finally, in the bottom middle, we have head standing, which in this case is associated with benthic feeding in this clip. So in the clip, let me start it there. You can see the first signal of head standing is you just see the fluke, meaning that the whale is essentially vertical head down in the water and it's suction feeding from the sandy muddy bottom and it's filtering out its benthic prey, the prey that was in that sandy mud, and it's filtering out all that muddy sand. So confirmation cue is that it's drooling mud, which is the name of the behavior, <laughs> drooling mud. Um, and that tells us that we know for sure that it was benthic feeding and head standing is, one, is the benthic feeding tactic. So we can now look to see if certain whales use specific tactics more often than others. And so this is similar to that um, number of flights per individual plot. We have the name of the whale on the x-axis this time. We have the name of the tactic on the y-axis and then the color of the little square represents the number of times that individual was observed exhibiting that, that tactic. And so I should note that this behavior is preliminary. This is only from 2020, um, and I haven't done any thorough analysis, but just to kind of look at some initial patterns, we can first look kind of from the perspective of the behaviors, which behaviors are more common than others. So you can see that turning and defecating were performed by a lot of the whales uh, in this data set. Whereas upside down swimming and sculling were not. Upside down swimming was performed by two whales and sculling was performed by only four. So some behaviors are more rare than others. And we can flip the perspective to now from that of the subject, we can see that Batman was observed side swimming and head standing, so using multiple feeding tactics while Soleil was only observed with sediment from an unknown source, which means that we knew that Soleil was diving and we see sediment kind of presumably coming from benthic feeding. So we've only ever seen Soleil benthic feed, whereas Batman has been seen as performing a couple different feeding tactics. So maybe Soleil is a specialist while Batman is a generalist, it's an in which once I can add all the years of the data set, we'll be able to answer that with a bit more certainty. And finally, um, not related to tactics, but as you saw in that, um, the side swimming video, they do the side swimming both forward, which means they're swimming on their side and stationary involve rolling to one side or the other. And there are some papers that talk about lateralization, essentially whales being right-sided or left-sided like humans. And those papers support that whales tend to be right-sided like humans. And so I started marking whether whales rolled or side swam on their left or right side. And I found results that agreed. So this is again, just from 2020, but on the X axis, we have left side and right side. On the Y, we have this 
the name of the whale that was seen side swimming. And the rectangle indicates the number of times it was seen on that side. And if it's this dark gray, that means it was never seen on that side. So that'd be a value of zero. And so what's exciting here is you see most of the whales were observed swimming on their right side. We have two whales, heart and nimbus, which have only been seen on their left side. And we have two whales that have been seen uh, using both, which is just a really cool result. And I'm excited to see um, what it looks like when we add the rest of the data set. So it looks like there might be some specialization within this group of individuals. And while that's cool and exciting to really think about what those results mean or what the consequences of specialization is, we need to link it to other factors. And one of those is the link between tactic and habitat. Uh, so this is essentially asking of those tactics, head standing, side swimming, upside down swimming, do those always happen in the same habitat type? Is side swimming always in a kelp bed? Is head standing always in sandy habitat? Because if that's true, and if an individual is specialized in a certain tactic, then that means that that individual is going to tend to spend most of its time in a specific habitat type, meaning that if we have a habitat map, we can predict more or less where certain individuals will spend more of their time, which could help inform conservation, especially if we know one area is noisier than another. But to do that, I had to start with a habitat map. So to make a benthic substrate habitat map, because we're interested in this, what is on the seafloor? Is it a kelp bed? Is it reef? Is it sand? Because we think this is what's associated with behavior. To build this map, we started by dropping GoPros off the boat on a line. Drop the GoPro, it has a weight. You let it kind of bounce around at the bottom for 30 seconds, bring it back up. Then we review the video and the benthic substrate, what's at the bottom is classified into these categories. You can see some examples here. So reef, boulder, kelp, sand, etc. And here on this plot, you can see all of our GoPro drops that we've ever done as points colored by the benthic substrate type. But as you can see, they're just points which line up to where our boat was, which in terms of trying to associate habitat with a whale isn't the most useful because the whale is not right by the boat. So we need we needed to develop a map that kind of expanded the area that this GoPro drop single point was informing. So to do that, I worked with the National Science Foundation Research Experience for Undergraduate or an NSF REU intern in summer of 2021, Mark Donnelly, to develop habitat maps to dig into this question of how behavior is associated with habitat. So he created a map at three spatial scales just to test if scale affected this relationship. And so here you can see the three maps. Uh, the Blue points represent observation of whales. All the other points represent the class, the GoPro drop location and the benthic classification from that GoPro drop. And then the polygons around each point are essentially the result of our analysis, which involved expanding the area around the point and then doing some other um, cool mapping techniques to try and capture, use if points were next to each other to kind of capture the overlap between having neighboring points of the same substrate type. And so what's really cool about this zoomed in area is that it shows you just how patchy this habitat is. So we have this line of reef, and then that's almost parallel for a while to this line of boulders. We have an area of sand, but then there's some reef in the sand. And so this map really captures how patchy it is. And then from those blue points that I mentioned, those are observations of whale locations. And so we classified every point as either foraging or traveling and use that with the map to look at if there were any relationships between habitat type and primary state being forage or travel. And so these are the results of foraging. So on the x-axis, we have the benthic substrate type and then on the Y, we have proportion of points in each uh, habitat type. You can see that the plot is repeated once per scale of map. We found that scale didn't really have an effect, so we'll just focus on the medium scale. 
The light color, every color represents a benthic substrate type that's also on the x axis. And the light color represents expected, and the darker shade represents observed. And so um, let's, I'll take a minute to kind of explain expected versus observed. So if you look at just the light colored bars, this is the distribution of our whale sightings throughout our field, our map area, regardless of behavior. And what this is showing you is that we just have seen more whales in reef habitat than in others without, regardless of the behavior state. And this is because we have a lot of reef area. We spend a lot of time around reefs. And so we wanted to calculate this expected distribution to account for our sampling pattern and the pattern of what habitat was even available in our study area. We then, for the expected, subsetted those whale observation points to just those from foraging habitat to compare foraging whales to kind of the distribution of all of the whales, regardless of behavior. And what we found for foraging is that we found more whales foraging in reef habitat than expected. And we found less whales foraging in sandy habitat than expected based on that distribution. And so our preliminary interpretation of this is that whales tend to forage more in reef habitat than any other, which makes sense. We know that uh, mycids, one of their predominant prey, their habitat is kelp. We see a lot of whales foraging in kelp, which grows on reefs. So this tracks with kind of our hypothesis, but interesting to see just in terms of foraging. Then when we looked at traveling, we actually saw something a little bit unexpected, which is that all the relationships were flipped. We saw for whales traveling less in reef habitat than expected and more in sandy bottom and hard bottom habitat than expected. And to be honest, we didn't expect to find a relationship at all. Traveling is just motoring through an area, is just kind of going through an area pretty quickly. But our current theory as to why this pattern is, is that the reef habitat tends to be close to shore in shallower water and so maybe whales are, don't want to travel through those areas because there's more chance of potentially getting slammed into a rock or a reef by a wave. You also might run into more other whales feeding and you don't want, you want to avoid competition. So maybe open, deeper, sandy bottom habitat is just more convenient for traveling. We're not entirely sure um, and definitely excited to kind of dig into this result a little bit more. And so the next kind of question with this is to do this analysis, but with specific tactics. And as I've alluded to, we uh, have a lot of hypotheses and ex we expect to see a few relationships. For example, upside down swimming and jaw snapping are usually observed over reefs. Side swimming and sculling uh, has been observed a lot in kelp and obviously this head standing behavior in sand. And so this is the next step of this analysis that um, I'm excited to dig into. And so this space component is important to link to individual specialization. And the next component that we need to know is essentially estimating the cost of these different tactics. Are they, is one more costly than the other, more beneficial than the other? And the way to do this is through body condition, which is important to link to individuals because again, if an individual is using a specific tactic, more than any other that might be incurring a specific set of costs or consequences that will that then we'll see reflected in its body condition. So the first step to doing this, though, before we can go straight to body condition is to try and estimate the cost, which we do using respiration rate. We, as of now, can't attach a heart rate monitor to a gray whale all the time. And so our best proxy is its breathing rate after about of a specific behavior. So if I told you to go run a hundred meter dash, you'd be breathing pretty heavily and I, that's an indicator that you just expended a lot of energy and engaged in a costly activity versus if you just sat on your couch for an hour, your breathing rate would be pretty slow and that'd be indicative that you hadn't spent a lot of energy. And so to do this for this study, we use the inner breath interval which is actually the inverse of respiration rate. So a longer inner breath interval or the time between breaths indicates a lower cost. So here you can see this traveling whale come to the surface. And as I, if you're sitting relaxed, you're breathing pretty slowly, meaning you're taking more time between breaths. So higher interval, lower cost. 
versus a foraging whale, or you who just ran the 100 meter dash, are breathing pretty fast, so you have less time between your breaths, so a lower inner breath interval is indicative of a high cost. So we first dug into this comparing foraging and traveling, and this comparison has also been done by boat-based studies. And you can see here we have foraging and traveling on the x-axis with the sample size underneath. So this is again just from a quick pilot study and the mean blow interval on, in seconds on the y. And you can see the pattern that we, the trend that we expect. Traveling has a significantly higher inner breath interval than foraging. Traveling costs less energy than foraging as we expect. However, your breathing rate is not only controlled by the behavior that you're engaging in, it's also affected by how big an animal is. So the next step was to try and look at the effective total length of a whale uh, on its breathing rate. So this is work that I did with an OSU undergraduate, Catherine McCallan, to do, again, a very small pilot. So you can see the small sample size and the number of points to look at total length and blow interval and behavior. So we have the total length of the whale in meters on the x-axis, the mean inner blow interval on the y, and then the primary state traveling in uh, pink and foraging in turquoise. And what you can see is that same trend of traveling having a higher, longer inner breath interval than foraging. But what's interesting is that looking at traveling, it looks like total length does have an effect on traveling. The inner breath interval increases with length, which we expect. But with foraging, it doesn't appear to have much of an effect. And so recognize this is a small sample size. If this pattern does turn out to hold true with a bigger sample size, one potential explanation is that foraging is just so energetically costly that the length of the whale doesn't matter. But when it's traveling, we do see the effect of this scaling with length because it's a less costly activity. And the next step, is to look at tactic, which is the general pattern of all of my questions. And so this is again from a pilot study, you can see small sample sizes, but we have um, behavior on the X. So we have foraging other, which means that we couldn't identify the foraging tactic from the drone footage, but we knew it was foraging from the field notes, head standing, side swimming and traveling. And we have the mean blow interval on the Y. And this is a really interesting initial result because it looks like side swimming has a similar cost to traveling, meaning a not very high cost, but headstanding appears to be very energetically costly, which is a really interesting result if we do have specialization, because we can look to see if these whales that engage in behaviors of very different costs, do they have different body conditions, any differences between them that indicate any consequences or effects of these choosing these different tactics. And the way that I'm gonna try and kind of connect that question is by using body condition. And so to briefly describe how we quantify body condition, we take still images from our drone footage and then use two softwares to do so, Morphometrics and Collatrix, which I helped develop. Morphometrics is used to measure the whale. So we measure the total length from the tip of the rostrum to the fluke notch here. And then we measure widths at 5% increments down the body. Collatrix is then used to collate and calculate body condition. The metric that the Gem Lab uses is the is BAI or the body area index. You can think of it as uh, similar to body mass index in humans, where we calculate the surface area of the whale between the head and the tail because it's not really gaining or losing fat outside that range. Calculate the surface area and then we standardize that by the total length to essentially be able to compare whales of different sizes. So if I compare the surface, ale, surface area of a mom to that of her calf, the mom would have greater surface area. However, if you account for the fact that she's just a bigger whale, you would likely see that the calf is in better body condition, but we had to account for length. So that's why we're using this unitless standardized metric. And just to show kind of how BAI reflects changes in body condition, here we have two images of uh, clouds and you can see your calf cheetah underneath her here. In 2016, in June and October, in June, she's lactating, so she's nursing. It's also early in the foraging season. She hasn't had a lot of time to eat. And you can see that she's visibly quite skinny and has a pretty low BAI of 32. 
Whereas it, by October, when she's post weaning, meaning she's not nursing anymore and has had months to gain fat and eat a lot, you can see that she looks to be in visibly better body condition and her BAI has increased by quite a lot. Now it's about 39. So the first thing that we do with this data is look at kind of how BAI has changed over time at the group level. So this is BAI on the y-axis, year on the x. And you can see that BAI was, looked, was pretty high in 2016 and then decreased in 2017, 18, and maybe it started to come up again in 2019, which is an interesting trend. And one of kind of the first thoughts behind why it was observed is maybe it had something to do with prey. If body condition is an indicator of foraging success. Maybe the prey availability changed. And so this is a paper from a Gem Lab PhD graduate, Layla Lamus' uh, 2020 paper showing uh, how the cumulative upwelling index changed uh, across time. So time on the X is in day of year. Our field season is between the days marked by these uh, vertical black dashed lines. And you can think of the cumulative upwelling index as a very a broad proxy for productivity. So upwelling is the process of cold nutrient rich water being brought up to the surface, which tends to be associated with productivity and high prey availability. Um, so you can, for now, just think of the cumulative upwelling index as high index, high prey availability, more or less. And the different colored lines represent different years between 2013 and 18, and the black line indicates the mean. And so the first big thing to notice here is this pink line of 2016, indicating that upwelling was quite low in 2016. And if we look back at this plot, 2017 is the first year of the decline. And so we think that this is evidence of the carryover effect meaning that low prey availability in 2016, they didn't eat very well, and that is shown in 2017. 2018 here in the light blue is a little bit higher, but not much. So potentially indicating, again, not the best foraging success. Uh, sorry, 2017 and then 2018 in the yellow is right about in line with the mean, and we see 2019 starting to bounce back. So maybe we're seeing this carryover effect of the prey availability in one year affects your body condition the next year. And what would be really interesting would be to look at which whales were using which foraging tactics and if that translated to a certain amount of success or lack of success in the next year and how um, different individuals react to this carryover effect, not just the population level. And speaking of individuals, we can also use BAI to look at an individual's history over time. So this is a BAI, pl BAI plot for Scarlet, one of our uh, one of my favorite whales, who we've seen for many years of our study. And here you can see her BAI across time. This is date on the x-axis written as year, month, day, and then BAI on the y. The vertical lines are separating out the years. And then the color of the point indicates her reproductive status. So Scarlett is not just extra cool because we've seen her over many years. She's also amazing because we've seen her in many different reproductive statuses. So we can compare this, all these trends for this one whale. So when she was lactating, this means that we saw her with a calf, she was nursing. And you can see these pink points in 2016 and 2020 are all quite low, which is what we expect for a lactating female. When she was resting, meaning that she was not with a calf and she was not pregnant, this blue point, so you can see it's a little bit variable, but more or less increasing throughout the season. And then the clearest trend is from when she was pregnant in 2019. And you can see this very clear increase in her body condition, which of course is not just indicative of foraging success, but also of fetal growth. And so, this again, indivi these individual BAI patterns, I hope to link to individual behavior patterns and then connect all of this back into this PCOM framework. And so I hope that now <laughs> this whirlwind tour of all of our behavior questions you can see how all of this feeds into these patterns by understanding baseline patterns of behavior, we can then investigate maybe how disturbance is changing them and how that change in behavior could cascade through all these relationships into changes in health and vital rates. And so just quickly to review within behavior, 
we're looking at, I want to first look at individual specialization, which is this very important baseline to then connect to the spatial patterns of those behaviors, and then what the costs energetically are of those behaviors, which I can then link to the health of the whale through looking at the relationship of that behavior and its cost to the body condition of the whales using those behaviors. And then finally, what I didn't really talk about today, but linking the patterns of all of that to then the frequency of social behavior and trying to see if maybe there's a threshold of body condition that's related to uh, engaging in social behavior or not. So that was quite a whirlwind. Um, and I just wanted to end with a shout out of some opportunities to check out other gem lab work. So we just have a relatively new website, Individual. Um, highlighting some of our amazing PCFG whales. You can learn from them by name, learn about their history. You can learn more about uh, how we're studying them. And then I also encourage you to follow us at our GemLab blog, the link here. You can subscribe in this little box here. If you go to our website, we uh, post weekly, the entire lab, all of our graduate students, postdocs, um, post about what we're studying, what we're interested in, what we're up to. So I highly encourage you to follow us there. Um, and I lastly just want to thank um, my advisor, Lee, our incredible field team, everyone uh, in the GEM lab for their support, and of course, our um, funding sources. If you have any questions after today, you're welcome to email me. My email is here. Follow me on Twitter. And as I said, follow our blog. With that, I'll take any questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Clara. I'm always just so fascinated at all the little details that go into a study like this. Um, so audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, drop them in the chat box. And I also have just put in uh, Clara's email so you can copy and paste it really easily as well if you wanna get a hold of her. So, while questions come in, I always like to start it out with what inspired you to study this? Did you just see whales one day in your life? You were like, oh my gosh, I must learn about that. <laughs> um, I, I actually didn't know that I wanted to study whales my entire life. I knew I wanted to study the ocean my entire okay. life. Um, nice. I grew up, my mother is from Spain, so I grew up snorkeling in the Mediterranean. Very cool. um, and then it's through my undergraduate work at Duke when I was introduced to drones and the technology and I actually was just really into all of these like analytical programming methods. Um, and then that's how I kind of got involved in the whale work, um, which kind of gave me a really nice skill set to come here and um, work on this project, which has been um, an absolute dream. Nice. And so we have a question here. Can you define again, benthic substrate? Uh -huh. Yes. It's a great question. I should have clarified. So the benthic, the benthos is essentially the seafloor bottom of the ocean. So your benthic substrate is what is, what does that look like? So a benthic substrate could be sandy bottom. If it's just kind of a big flat sandy expanse, if it's a rocky reef, then that's that benthic substrate is basically what material is at the bottom of the ocean. Okay. And then have you documented any effects of the drones on the behavior of the whales? Mm, that's a great question. Um, no, we, that's a, we have not um, seen our drones impact the whales. We fly quite high, usually at about 45 meters over the whale. Um, we have permits that don't let us get too close to them. Um, and we don't, yeah, we don't think they really like hear it very much or notice it above them. And I also always like to add that what another benefit of the drone is that because we can get close to the whale with the drone, we can stay further away with the boat and we know they can hear that. And we know that that has a more yeah. disturbing effect. Um, so I've, I have never seen the, I haven't seen a whale react to a drone, but I also think that um, if it does, it's a little bit of the lesser of two evils. Mm -hmm. And you're right. The boat noise is probably way more uh, disruptive to them um, than the drone above. Um, okay, so who gets to name the whales? <laughs> <laughs> because they're such fun names that that are were displayed 
Uh, the tradition has changed over time. So I think in the early days, it was whoever discovered that it was a new whale. Okay. The current tradition, which is my favorite, is that we, what throughout the season, kind of build our list of who we think is new. But at the end, we confirm it and we actually have a naming party where we make a PowerPoint and everyone sits in a room and looks at the pictures and we debate uh, at length what the name should be. And we vote or we choose as a group. So, yeah. That must be a fun process. To, yeah. What was it? Orange knuckles. Orange <laughs> knuckles. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think they get a little crazier every year. <laughs> um, here's the question. Is this report working toward an understanding of whales' reaction to noise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the ultimate goal. Um, this study is, well, the kind of overarching project is focused on ambient noise. So a little bit different from other studies you may have seen about the effect of sonar or active sonar, kind of really loud kind of shorter term disturbances. This is we're trying to get at more the effect of, you know, July 4th and everyone's on the water and all of that maybe lower ambient noise of all the boats in the ocean, all the vessels nearby affecting the whales. So we are hoping by having these, we have these hydrophones, so they're constantly recording the noise of the ocean in our study area. We want to link that to the whale stress levels and their health and their behavior to, to hopefully get at that impact. That's awesome. And now I might have missed this or something. Do you do this just off of Oregon or do you go up and down into Washington and down into California and like even as far as Baja where they're nursing and calving mm. down there? Yeah. Um, so our this project is specifically off of Newport. It's a pretty small okay. range. It's from about Seal Rock um, to Boiler Bay. If you're okay. local and you know those landmarks. <laughs> um, but uh, we do have collaborators um, kind of throughout the PCFG region that we try and kind of shit collect or contribute data to each other and get an idea of who's seeing who where, because there are some whales in our area that other researchers have also seen in their study areas. Um, and in terms of going as far south as Baja, we haven't done that. We would love to one day. There are researchers down there and we have done um, a little bit of collaboration with them. So, yeah. yeah nice. Um, here's another one. Are you looking at vibrations and shaking caused by noise? Hmm. Interesting question. Uh, we're not, <laughs> to my knowledge, um, although, interesting side note, my lab mate just did a side project looking at the effect of the sound from earthquakes in New Zealand, underwater oh. earthquakes on blue whales, and found that there was no uh, behavioral change oh. in to the sound of an earthquake. So Wow. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. And that looks like it wraps our questions, but we do have a few comments here. Just excellent research, great detail, um, fascinating uh, foundation for whale studies. They want you to return again to share uh, your results. Uh, thank you for your amazing analysis. The relationship between your drone use and data collection gives a totally new perspective of whale behavior. So very appreciative for this research that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to say thank you so much again for joining us this evening. Yeah. And thank you to the audience for joining us as well. I always appreciate your questions and the time you give to come and learn about these things and do share at least one thing with somebody else. Um, and spread the knowledge. But with that, I hope you all have a wonderful evening and maybe I'll see you at a future presentation. Bye-bye.